ever since Cordyceps has been brought into the mainstream of, of horror films or horror media because of The Last of Us, everyone now is looking at other diseases and other things that uh, can potentially cause a global pandemic or something crazy like that. It's like the... Uh, you ever heard of like the zombie, uh, like the zombie brain worms that are affecting moose up in Canada? Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, basically these worms attach themselves to the brain of the moose, and it turns them into a violent, just like like thing that acts out hmm. until eventually, like the moose starves to death. I don't hmm. think I have it all memorized. Leucochloridium paradoxum, or the green banded brood sac, is a parasitic flatworm that uses snails as an intermediate host. If you can't tell, Nick used to be in a band called Paradoxum and he had to recite that at almost every time they started their show. Yeah. So, if you didn't know, it's a little colorful parasitic worm. It gets in a snail, it basically poofs into the snail's eye stalks. So it blinds the snail, and the snail can no longer tell the difference between light and dark, so it'll remain out during the day when normally it would be going somewhere safe. That makes it an easy target for birds. And then the little worms will pulse around in the eye stalks, and they look like a little colorful caterpillar. And that will make the birds even more likely to be like, ooh, caterpillar, and they'll grab the snail and eat it, along with the paradoxum. Uh, or the green bit of brood sack. And then the birds will have the eggs in their stomach, which they will then poop back down. And snails eat bird poop, if you didn't know that. So The, yeah, the cycle again. repeats. It's, it's literally like an endless cycle of just, just craziness. It's similar to cordyceps, but it's, I don't know. The, so what happens if... The brood sacks are just prettier than... Cordyceps, not on me. <laughs> like, yeah. If, so what if a predator eats the bird before it poops? I would guess that it kind of fucks it all up, but also don't know for sure. I never really looked that far into it. Yeah. But if you don't know, cordyceps is a is a is a type of fungus, type of mycelium, like a mushroom mm-hmm. that basically. Uh, Corrupt the brain of the host. Which is usually an ant. Yeah, but it's actually, they found it in grasshoppers, moths, and oh, okay. other types of insects, too. And basically, it causes them to go up to the top of where the colony is, like right above it, and then, like, latch on to, like, a branch or something and die. And then, after the, the creature dies, a stalk starts to grow at the back of its head. Mm-hmm. And that stalk mm-hmm. shoots off spores. And those spores, when ingested by other insects, basically gets, like, the mycelium takes over whichever mm-hmm. insects, like, uh, like takes in those uh, spores. Hmm. Thus spreading, like, spreading it. Entire ant colonies have just been destroyed by, by uh, cordyceps. Same thing with some grasshopper colonies and stuff like that. It's pretty insane. Hmm. And the thing is, the reason why fu- like the fungus cannot live or cannot affect us humans is because our bodies are too warm. Oh. It's only able to affect insects and other creatures that don't have like a warm, you know, aren't warm blooded. And basically, by us being a little bit warmer. We're capable of resisting and not have the fungus grow. Hmm. But, but if it ever evolves, then the last of us happens. Exactly. Hmm. And then we're fucked. Literally. <laughs> Zombie apocalypse. So, this nightmare has been brought to you by the Renegades. But now, here's something completely different. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Why are you running? <laughs> I'm really back on any <laughs> 
Ah, spooky season. You knew this was coming. We're always talking about all the ways nature and the Whoa! things can put you on a oh, shirt, but we never talked about how diseases can have animals permanently parallel to the ground. So that's what this video is. Animal diseases that are rated R for the regret I feel when I see what researching them has done to my search history. <laughs> and of course, viewer discretion is very much advised. Especially for disease number one. What's a Halloween video without a jump scare? Ooh. This photo was taken just outside the Caribbean Bay Hotel in Zimbabwe of what appears to be a hairless baboon. The depelted primate appeared to be an outcast, only following her true from a distance, almost as if she had been rejected for her appearance. And according to a nearby vet, the most likely cause for this abandoned baboon's condition, mange. Mange is a nasty looking disease caused by parasitic mites burrowing into the skin where their collective feces can cause severe allergic reactions and an unbearable amount of itching. That's why the main calling card of mange is turning animals into the most down bad version of themselves. And while the word mangy is usually an insult reserved for dogs, these mites can be a certainty from anything from foxes to bears to porcupines, occasionally birds like eagles, and many, many more. Yeah. In fact, the legend of the chupacabra was more than likely jump-started by a severely mited up coyote. And in 1996, there was an outbreak of sarcoptic mange that griefed a family of mountain gorillas in Uganda, even expiring one of their babies. Mm. The mites yeah. themselves aren't a death sentence, but they slowly weaken the target, making them much more vulnerable to infections. And they can easily spread, especially if you're a wombat who's burrow mates with a walking mite mosh pit. The mites are so persistent that in Pennsylvania, a black bear with more than 50% hair loss is considered a lost cause. And not only is it retired from life, it's also incinerated so the past tense bear can't possibly infect any others. And yes, mange is zoonotic, meaning it can be passed on from animals to humans. And when that happens, it's called scabies. To be fair, it's normally easy to treat in people, but those with weak immune systems or those taking immunosuppressants can find themselves gatekept from a life of comfort. There's also demodex mites, which shack up in hair follicles oh, and even makes me species itch to think about their home oh. in the human oh, yeah. eye. So yeah, mange just might be the most aesthetically upsetting ailment here. The polar opposite of the next disease, because where mange is visually visceral, zoocosis is almost purely psychological. You've probably heard of the condition where animals in captivity do the same thing over and over with no goal or purpose, almost like they're in a trance. And one of the most popular examples of this are those videos of elephants swaying back and forth. Except zoocosis is much more than that. Of course, you have your swaying and almost neurotic pacing around their enclosure, but the zoocosis signature also includes excessive grooming, personal punishment like self-biting and self-mutilation, turning puke into an infinite food glitch, and coprophagia, even in animals that wouldn't normally do it. But the disturbing part is, like mange, it's believed that zoocosis can also be contagious. If an animal is housed next to one exhibiting the stereotypes associated with it, chances are that same animal will too. This captive psychosis is likely triggered by a lack of stimulation and enrichment, and it's more common in higher intelligence animals, especially those that would normally have a wider range. Elephants checking both boxes is likely why 40% of captive turned pachyderms show symptoms of zoocosis. Orcas are one of the smartest non-human creatures alive and can travel well over 40 miles a day for food. And almost a year ago today, in 2022, a captive orca named Hugo tragically resigned from reality after violently slamming into his tank wall until he suffered a life-ending aneurysm. And in 2005, a mother hamadris baboon groomed her baby so excessive- Aww. It's so ugly, but it's cute at the same time. <laughs> I about said something very Thank bad, but I'm glad cute. I didn't. Hmm. Yes, hey man, I didn't know that uh they had ba they had Pete Davidson's baby picture. That he looked like he came out the womb beefing with wizards. To be butt. fair, we can't really prove that this was zoocosis working oh overtime. Gosh. But bro got the Mr. Clean cut. That ain't a fade. <laughs> most popular and probably most depressing case of kosis was Gus. Gus was a polar bear that lived in Central Park Zoo for 25 years. Uh -oh. At one point, visitors and keepers noticed that Gus would spend all day swimming in figure eights, sometimes for up to 12 hours straight. Keep in mind that polar bears can cover nearly 50 miles in a day searching for seals. Not only did the zoo spend 25 grand on therapy for the bear, Gus went on to make history as the very first zoo animal to be put on Prozac. Speaking of which, the 25,000 bones of behavioral therapy basically amounted to the therapist saying, it be like that. This isn't an anti-zoo video or me trying to morally grandstand to y'all. I think zoos have the potential for a lot of good and a lot of bad. It's just that the bad can lead to a chronically pilled out polar bear. But wait, it gets darker. 
because with how far removed humans have gotten from nature, there's a legitimate fear that humanity as a whole could be suffering from zoocosis on a global scale. Mm. That joke about us being no different than ants stuck in a death spiral becomes less and less of a joke as time goes on. Well, I mean... You're not wrong. What is the definition of insanity? And there's a lot of human beings out there who I know that that are definitely guilty of that and they keep repeating the same thing over and over again and it's like it, it's like my my friend Amos I love him to death but he keeps doing the same shit over and over again and expecting things to change but did you say Amos or Amos <laughs> why would I have a friend named Amos I don't know Amos <laughs> A-M-O-S We usually just call him famous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kate, Kate and her dirty mind, dude. What are you gonna do? Well, you said shit, and I was like, okay. Well, I don't know if you said. I at least I asked. <laughs> eh, well, it's okay. But all right. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Do you remember the Will Smith movie, I Am Legend? You know, before his wife publicly neutered him and then smoked both his family jewels in two packs? Well, the post-apocalyptic movie started with a doctor attempting to re-engineer the measles virus in an attempt to find a cure for cancer, instead infecting 99% of the human race. A pretty good example of what can happen when humans try to play God with the natural order. Another example is what happened in Florida, specifically Silver Springs State Park. It's Florida's very first tourist attraction, famous for having a couple Tarzan movies shot there. And in the 1930s, tour boat operator Colonel Tui was looking for a way to spice up his jungle cruise ride. So he brought in six Reese's macaques and had them placed on a small island in the park. And it was at this moment, they f***ed up. Apparently, nobody involved was told that the monkeys could swim, and the moment they touched down on dry land, the macaques proceeded to swim out to the mainland. And following lots of multiplying without a calculator, there are now currently hundreds of rogue macaques, with a good number of them carrying a deadly herpes virus. Herpes B is an incapacitating condition that can cause severe brain inflammation, permanent neurological damage, and a permanent lease in a casket-shaped condo. Now, for the mongering aside, the chances of catching it from a monkey are incredibly rare but not rare enough to be zero. In 1997, a researcher was working with Arises when she was splashed in the eye by indeterminate fluids. Mm. Even after immediately flushing her eye out for several minutes, the 22-year-old died December 10th, 1997, almost exactly six weeks after first being exposed. According to the Center of Disease Control, since 1932, there have been 51 cases of people being infected with the B virus, with 21 deaths and an 80% mortality rate for those untreated. That mm. same fatal virus is currently being backpacked by up to a quarter of the hundreds of macaques running around the Sunshine State. Worse, it's believed they shed the potent virus through their saliva. So far, there's no known case of one of these Marion County monkeys passing off the virus to a human. The problem is, the monkeys have managed to lose their natural fear of humans, and there was even one incident where the park had to be shut down after a family was threatened and chased by an especially malicious macaque. It's the worst kind of invasive, and it's 100% our fault, and although the virus peddling primates haven't caught a human body, it's definitely one of those cases of F around and find out. One of the most unsettling diseases in nature is a sickness that affects deer, known as chronic wasting disease, called so because it essentially that. destroys the animal from the inside out. In fact, this type of disease is a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, a name that literally comes from the fact that it causes several sponge-like holes in the brain. Mm -hmm. It's like the forbidden final boss of trypophobia, and it's caused by a single misfolded protein known as a prion. This prion triggers a chain reaction where the only outcome is a canceled life subscription, and the only thing the victim can do is wait for the sweet release of death. Mm -hmm. Here's what the end game of a deer with CWD looks like. It starts with a misfolded protein affecting and altering perfectly normal proteins. It's almost like a cellular level cheese touch, and the moment it starts, it's already over. Step two includes the prions exploding in numbers exponentially and accumulating in the body. The whole time the deer, elk, or moose looks and acts perfectly normal. 
the deer can walk around with this disease for two whole years before the chronic becomes critical. Eventually, it escalates to the point where the prions manage to break into the blood-brain barrier, where they start destroying neurons, putting enough holes in the brain to get it cursed out by an octopus, and slowly wasting the poor, unexpecting deer. Deer with CWD seem unable to process anything around them, including danger, and if predators or playing freeze tag on the freeway doesn't take them off the census, they die a slow and painful death to starvation as their brains shut down. The worst part is, the nightmare doesn't end once the deer does, since the prions responsible can exist in an area years after the victim and can even be absorbed by plants in contaminated soil. That's Damn. assuming they don't just wow. leach into groundwater. In fact, the only surefire way to eliminate a prion is literally that, fire. Except, it's not as simple as cremating a casualty. That'd be too easy. It's said that it takes heat at a minimum of 900 degrees Fahrenheit or 482 degrees Celsius to properly pack up a prion, and some sources say to hike that up to 1800 to be safe. But the part that makes prions one of the most horrific things not native to a horror movie is where they come from. It's believed there are three main factors that cause prion diseases. Genetics play a relatively small part, with only 10 to 15% of cases in people being attributed to them. The second and by far most common cause is the disease being sporadic. Basically, that just means that not even science can fully explain where they come from, but that it's like it happens out of nowhere. And the third is an infected deer contaminating something like a water source or a feeding station with body fluids and passing it off to the next. And remember, not only can prions insist on existing years after the fact, keep in mind that most infected deer look no different from any other, right until it's time to disconnect from interface eternally. That means that the three main causes of wasting disease are completely RNG, and that is remarkably terrifying. <coughs> and it's not just deer that can get packed up by prions. There's mad cow disease in cattle and scrapey in sheep, named after the fact that it can cause them to compulsively rub up against things like fence posts until they literally scrape their wool off. There's even a human equivalent, Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. And while there's no known reports of a human ever catching CWD, specialists have warned that with the thousands of CWD infected animals eaten by people a year, there's a growing concern that the disease may eventually be transmitted to people. But maybe it's still a lot better than the last, and in my opinion, the most horrific disease in this video. Because not only is rabies one of the harshest death sentences oh. nature can serve, it is 100% transmissible to humans. Rabies is said to bury nearly 60,000 people a year, and since the most common way to get it is through dog bites, it's the worst in places with a high stray population. Which is why India, a country that criminalized murking stray dogs, has about 20,000 names crossed off the census a year by rabies. And it's children that are especially at risk, with about 40% of deaths coming from those 15 years old or younger. Here's what it's like to be turned into a statistic by rabies. It starts with the virus entering the peripheral nervous system, usually through a bite. Then, it travels inside you through nerves until it reaches part of the central nervous system, or the spinal cord. From there, it's a straight shot directly to the brain, and at this point, you can start drafting your will cause ain't no way. While you can treat the virus before it reaches the brain, once it does, you're almost guaranteed to become a was. Yep. The virus then multiplies, then spreads throughout the body, slowly killing you from the brain out. But the underrated and truly sinister aspect of rabies is how it seemingly rewires your brain for its own purposes. One of the telltale signs of rabies is a crippling fear of water, where just the sight or suggestion of it can cause incredibly painful spasms in the throat and larynx. At the same time, the virus attacks the salivary glands, causing excessive drooling and the foaming at the mouth the disease is famous for. And that's because the virus is most concentrated in the mouth, and swallowing or drinking water would dilute it, so the hydrophobia helps keep the mouth and all the nastiness inside as potent as possible. And that's not the only way rabies manipulates its mark. There's believed to be three stages of rabies Didn't in animals. Know that about the you got water, the prodromal really. stage, and that's where the animal Me might either. start showing minor changes in behavior. And then you got the phase likely everyone associates with rabies, oh, the excitative stage. It's been called furious rabies since it's characterized by heightened aggression and random outbursts of violence. Animals that would normally be wary of people, such as foxes, can attack completely out of nowhere with bites. And remember, being a water bigot just makes that bite that much more toxic. And then there's a paralytic or dumb stage, where the animal appears unaware and disconnected from the world around it. This is where you might see a normally introverted mammal show zero fear in humans. But don't be fooled, they're still liable to bite to serve the virus's purpose. The nightmare usually ends with the animal flatlining to respiratory arrest, as its body finally just gives up. And your fate is almost no better if you're a human, since rabies has one of the highest KD ratios of any disease, even though it's also one of the oldest. It flexes a nearly 100% fatality rate, but nearly means there's still a chance. 
In 2004, 15-year-old Gina Gizzi contracted rabies after being infected by a bat, and the moment she started experiencing symptoms, she was, statistically speaking, a walking corpse. Dr. Willoughby, who had studied up on rabies, figured their last chance was to put the teenager in a coma, in a last-ditch effort to save her brain and give her body a reasonable chance to fight off the virus. About a week after she was induced, Gina miraculously started producing rabies antibodies, and after Euro-stepping death, she would go through the grueling rehab of relearning how to walk, talk, and even stand. Cause even when you're lucky, it ain't easy being geezy. She became the first person to ever survive the rabies virus without a vaccination, and even went on to start a family. But don't yeah. get it twisted, the Milwaukee protocol that saved her has been used on 41 people, and only six have survived. The ones that do still run the risk of waking up severely disabled, which is the best you can do when negotiating with death since that's exactly what treating rabies is. It's a horrifically debilitating disease, and even though it takes about one to three months to show symptoms after being infected, there have been cases of people walking around with the virus <coughs> for seven years. At the same time, if the virus manages to invade you close enough to your brain, you can easily be down bad less than a week after being exposed. With a virtually 100% kill rate, and the thousands that lose their lives to it a year, it's definitely one of the most unforgiving viruses out there. Which is why the greatest basketball player of all time isn't Michael Jordan, LeBron James, or even Kobe Bryant, it's Manu Ginobili. Because during a Spurs-Kings game in 2009, a bat managed to find its way inside the arena, causing everyone to immediately panic. Until the 6'5 Argentinian backhanded the bat and put it out of commission, and proceeded to help lead his team to a 20-point win, along with a victory by TKO against the bat. One man managed to potentially solo one of the deadliest viruses of all time, and he wasn't even a starter. And you'll never guess what day this happened. Yeah, that's right. Happy Halloween. Ah. And stay safe out there. <laughs> Halloween of Wow. Jesus. Did, I, I remember that, that story about Mono Ginobili smacking the shit out the bat. But I, I couldn't remember when that happened. Yeah, the chances are never zero, so take that as a as a point to just say, don't be stupid. Like, literally, don't be stupid. Yep. I hate to do it, but this video was so scary that I almost peed myself. Not, not really, I just drank too much liquid. Ah, uh, so he... So, uh, he... I'm gonna All have right. to run and let you guys start wrapping this up. I'll be right back. <laughs> well, we'll just go ahead and wrap it up. So, yeah. Animal diseases that belong in a horror movie. Definitely so. I I agree. Mm -hmm. Some of those are horrifying. Yeah. So, anyway. I got nothing else to add. Other than to just thank y'all very much for tuning in. And thank y'all for recommending this. And I guess until next time, everybody. Signing off. I'm Nate. I'm Kate. And uh, there went Nick. And we'll see you in the next one, everybody. Peace. <laughs>